Guys, we're back. I have given the test that I had to give, and so it's time to give you guys some more lecture. Now, we're talking about energy, and right now we're dealing with spring potential energy and converting spring potential energy to kinetic energy and kinetic energy back to spring potential energy, okay? So if we think about the total mechanical energy in the system, that should be an E there. Remember I told you that E it equals one half kx squared plus one half mv squared. That's essentially saying that the sum of the kinetic energy initially plus the sum of the spring potential energy initially has to equal the kinetic energy final plus the spring potential energy final. So we're going to look at two problems. We're going to look at problem 17 and then we're going to look at problem 19. Now let's go to the test. Now these problems are in chapter 10. Remember I am mixing chapter 10 and chapter 9 together. Okay, so we can see 17 and 19. Problem 17 says that a student places her 500 gram physics book on a frictionless table. She pushes the book back against the spring and compresses the spring to four centimeters, then releases the book. What is the book speed as it slides away from the spring? Okay, the spring constant is 1,250 newton meters, newtons per meter. All right, guys. Now, if we think about it before, I've got a compressed spring and I've got a book here. Whee! Those are the pages in the book, and that's the spine of the book. Okay, so. It says that the spring has been compressed four centimeters. So if this is x equals zero, this is x equals minus 0 0.04 meters. And the mass of the book is given to us as 500 grams, so that's 0 0.500 kilograms. Velocity initially is zero, okay? And the spring constant was given to us as 1,250 newtons over meters. So initially what I have is my kinetic energy being zero and my spring potential energy being one half times 1,250 newtons per meter times 0 0.04 meters squared. So let's pop that through. 0 0.04 squared times 1250 divided by 2. Oh, we get a whopping one joule of energy. Okay? Now, in the end, our spring is going to complete be completely extended so it's at x equals zero it's at its equilibrium point and the book whee, is going to be sliding away with a velocity i'll call it v fine okay so here the spring potential energy is zero and the kinetic energy is one half times 0 0.500 kilograms v final squared. So I've got zero plus one joule has to equal half of 0.5 is 0 0.250 kilograms v final squared plus zero. So one divided by 0 0.250 Take the square root, says that V final is two meters per second. That's the speed at which the book is moving away from the spring as soon as it breaks contact. 
And since it's frictionless, as long as it's on that frictionless surface, its velocity, its speed will remain two meters per second. Okay? Now, let's look at problem 19. 19 says a runaway grocery cart runs into a spring and the spring constant is 250 newtons over meters and compresses it 60 centimeters. What is the speed of the cart just before it hits the spring? Okay, so we can think about before, you know, as it makes contact with the spring is kind of our before, our initial. So in our initial, we have kinetic energy. It's gonna be one half times the mass of the cart, which was given to us as 10 kilograms, the initial squared. The spring potential energy initially is zero. In our final situation, our kinetic energy is zero because we've completely compressed the spring and it's come to a stop. The spring potential energy final is going to be one half times the K, which was 250 newtons over meters, and we compressed it 60 centimeters, so 0 0.60 meters squared. So I'm gonna go ahead and calculate the spring potential energy. So 250 times 0.6 squared, divided by two gives me 45. So I have 45 joules. So what I can say is one half times 10 kilograms, the initial squared plus zero has to equal zero plus 45 joules. So if I solve for V initial, I'm gonna take 45 divided by 10 multiply by 2, and then take the square root, I get 3 meters per second. That's how fast the cart was going right before it made contact with the spring. Now, we can kind of put this all together with the following equation. Kinetic energy initially plus gravitational potential energy initially plus spring potential in energy initially has to equal kinetic energy final plus gravitational potential energy final plus spring potential energy final. So I want us to look at problem 51 and probably 54 to kind of round this out and then we're going to go and talk about some things that are back in chapter 9 that we haven't looked at yet. So let's look at problem 54. Okay, so at the end of chapter 10, it's over on page 258. So we're gonna look at problem, I eh, went too far. There we go. It says the spring shown in figure 10.54 is compressed 50 centimeters and is used to launch a 100 kilogram physics student. The track is frictionless until it starts up the incline. The student's coefficient of friction on the 30 degree incline is 0.15. What is the student's speed just after losing contact with the spring? How far up the incline does the student go? Now, Guys, we're going to need to break this problem up into two pieces. What we want to do is we want to start, the, well, part A says what's its speed right after it breaks contact. Okay, so we're going to do that. But then to do part B, we want to think about the fact that here we have spring potential energy and gravitational potential energy. Down here, no spring, no gravitational, only kinetic energy. So in part B, we're going to shoot to find the speed right here at the bottom of the hill as it starts to come up the incline plane, 
And once it starts going up this inclined plane that has friction, then we're going to have to treat it like a motion problem. And we're going to have to use some of forces to figure out what the acceleration is due to the friction going up the inclined plane and acceleration due to gravity. So we've got a lot of stuff embedded in this problem. Okay, so let's start with part A. In part A, we want to know velocity of V final at moment we leave spring. Okay? So it's a very specific moment in time. Since there is no change in vertical position, I'm just going to say there's no change in gravitational potential energy. I'm just going to say that the spring potential energy initially is going to be one half times the K, which is 80,000 newtons per meter times the compression, which was given to us as 50 centimeters. So 0 0.50 meters squared. So let's punch that through. 0.5 squared times 80,000 divided by 2 gives us 10,000 joules. The kinetic energy initially is zero and our gravitational potential energy at this point I'm going to set to be zero. Remember it's arbitrary I get to choose where my zero point is and I'm putting it at the top of the hill. Our spring potential energy final here is zero. Our kinetic energy is going to be one half times the mass of the student and it's a 100 kilogram student. The final squared and gravitational potential energy is zero. So I have 10,000 joules, V plus zero is going to equal 50 kilograms V final squared plus zero plus zero. So 10,000 joules is going to equal 50 kilograms V final squared. So 10,000 divided by 50, take the square root of it. V final there is 14.1 meters per second. That's how fast the student is going at the moment they break contact with the spring. Okay, so that's the answer for part A. Now let's move on to part B. Now, I'm going to break B into two parts. I'm going to do speed at bottom of hill. Okay, so if you think about it, he's up here, he's going to go down to here, and then he's going to go up here. I want the speed right here because that's going to be the, well, I want the speed right here as we start to go up that incline that's at 30 degrees. Up to that point, I'm friction free. Up here, I have spring potential energy because I have the compressed spring, and I'm going to have gravitational potential energy. My kinetic energy initially is zero. Okay? Down here, my spring potential energy is going to be zero. My gravitational potential energy is going to be zero because this is where I'm going to set my y equals zero. y here is equal to 10 meters. Okay? And my kinetic energy is going to be something. So 
Our spring potential energy we already calculated. That was 10,000 joules. Our gravitational potential energy, looking at it this way, is going to be the mass, 100 kilograms, times acceleration due to gravity, 9.80 meters per second squared, times the height, 10 meters. So 100 times 10 times 9.8. So that's 9,800 joules. Okay. So initially, I have, well, I have 10,000 joules plus 9,800 joules plus zero then has to equal one half times 100 kilograms V final squared plus zero plus zero. So 19,800 joules times two divided by 100 Take the square root. His velocity there at the bottom of the hill is 19.9 meters per second. So at bottom of hill, V equals 19.9 meters per second. Okay. Now, now we've got a good old dynamics problem because once I hit the hill I've got friction so now my person has force due to gravity acting on them they have a frictional force they have a normal force and of course this has a force due to gravity y component force due to gravity x component our acceleration is going to be that way and our velocity initially is going to be up the hill and we know that this is a 30 degree angle. Now the force due to gravity is going to be 100 times 9.8, so that's 980 newtons. Force due to gravity x, okay, is just going to be 980 times the cosine of 60, so that's 490 newtons. Force due to gravity y would be 980 times the sine of 60. So that's 848 newtons. Some of the forces in the y direction would be the normal force plus the force due to gravity, zero. So the normal force is going to end up being 848 newtons. So our frictional force is going to be our coefficient of friction, which is 0 0.15 times 848 newtons. So 127 newtons. Some of the forces in the x direction, which is our kinetic frictional force, our force due to gravity x. That has to equal the mass times the acceleration in the x direction. So a minus 127 newtons plus a minus 490 newtons has to equal 100 kilograms times ax. So I get ax to be a minus 600, I mean 6.17 meters per second squared. Now, it wanted to know how far up the inclined plane I'm going to go. So I'm going to use V final squared equals V initial squared plus 2AX delta X to get me how far up that incline he slid. He's going to slide until he stops, so V final is going to be zero. And V initial we got was 19.9 meters per second plus two times the minus 6.17 meters per second squared, delta x. So 19.9 squared, take it over the other side, it's got a negative sign, the negatives cancel out, divided by two, 
divide by 6.17, 19.9, 19.9, 19.9 squared divided by 2 divided by 6.17. It says that that can't be right. I have done something wrong. So let's see, bottom of the hill. Make me double check against where I've already worked this to, because he's going way too high. Okay, there's that. Agreed there. Nope. No. Okay. So I get delta X to be 32.1 meters. That's how far he slides along the inclined plane. If we wanted to get his height above the ground, we could calculate that too, but it didn't ask us that. It just asked us how far up he was gonna slide. Now, I like this problem because it required you to go back and do some things that you'd done before, and you had to think about how to break up the problem into its pieces, okay? So that's about as complicated as one of these problems can get. All right, now we're going to kind of switch gears for a little bit, okay? And we're going to go back and pick up some concepts about how we calculate work. Now, remember earlier I said that we could calculate work as the integral of f of s ds. For a constant force, I told you that work was equal to the magnitude of that constant force times uh, along the direction of travel times the distance traveled. So F sub S is the portion of the force parallel to the direction of travel. And of course the book does really pretty pictures. So if that's our direction of travel, okay, you can see that only the force parallel to our direction of travel is going to do any work. So we can think of work as being F cosine of theta delta S if the force is constant. So if we look at tactic box 9.14, excuse me, 9.1 on page 214. I'm gonna pull up the tactic box. Okay. Let's look at the tactic box for a moment. And I'm sorry, I scooted that way out of frame. Okay. Okay. I may need to sh shuffle this out a little bit. Let's. Go. Okay. There we go. So. If the sign, if the angle between the force vector and the displacement vector is zero, then work is just F times delta R. Energy, well, I'm not gonna worry about that energy transfer. The energy is transferred into the system if this is an external force. The particle that's experienced that force will speed up. If I'm at an angle less than 90, then we're gonna have F times delta R times the cosine of theta, and we're gonna get a positive sign for work, so the object's going to speed up. If we've got an, an angle of 90 degrees, the cosine of 90 degrees is zero. So no energy is being transferred to the object experiencing that force, okay? If the force and the angle between the force and the displacement vector is greater than 90 degrees. Then our work done is negative. So that means essentially we're slowing the object down. You can think about it as taking energy out of the object. And if we're at 180 degrees, 
then the work done, you know, the cosine of 180 degrees is minus one, so it's just minus F delta R, okay? And we're taking energy away from whatever that object is that's experiencing the force, so it's going to have a decrease in kinetic energy. So that's a nice little tactic box to remind you, okay? This brings us to a point that we need to talk about. Work is a dot product of two vectors. If I have vector A and vector B, A dot B is AB cosine of theta. A dot product of two vectors always gives a scalar, okay, as an answer. So let's look at problem 14 on page 228. So let me get over here to 228. Come on, work with me, book. I'm going to look at problem 14. Okay, guys, there's problem 15. Let's get this over and down. So there's problem 14. It says evaluate the dot product of each of these vectors. Uh, well, each of these vector systems. So if I have A dot B, then I'm going to have 3 times 5 times the cosine of 40, which is going to give me 11.5. Okay? If I look at C dot B, I'm going to go 2 times 3 times 140 cosine, I get a minus 4.60. And in C, since we're dealing with a 90 degree angle, we know the dot product there is going to be 0. Now, I didn't write these out because I'm pretty sure you can follow along without me doing anything else. Okay, now let's look at problem 18. Why do I want to go to 18 just yet? Okay, so here in problem 18, we've got three ropes on a piano. Well, two ropes on a piano and gravity. So the two ropes seen in figure 9.18 are used to lower a 255 kilogram piano, five meters. Hello, Phyllis. Hi. 